it's mandated to do chemical assistance and protection. So there's, there's loads of training seminars and workshops uh, all over the world every, you know, every uh, every month actually. It's a big it's a big operation, but its budget is around 100 million dollars. It's 75, 70 million euros. Um, How is it funded? It's funded by uh, United Nations. Uh, United Nations percentages based on people's you know, economy, just like the United Nations. So the big, you know, the big elephant in the room, which funds about 22% of over 50 of such, these such organizations, World Health Organization, International Atomic Energy Agency, the United Nations, on and on, is the United States. Um, and your you know, much smaller countries fund much less. So it's not a same percentage, it's, it's based on your economy and your strength uh, as a country. The big, you know, the big funders are all a, a group of eight industrial nations. Um, but it's one, amongst, amongst all the agencies, except for the BWC, which Greg and I know well, um, it's the, really the smallest uh, financially. Comprehensive Test Pantry is much larger financially. Uh, the uh, IEA and the United Nations all have much larger budgets. And one of my concerns has been that this, this budget has really been cut heavily in the last five years. It's been kind of flatlined, uh, you know, partly due to pressure from the United States and other countries saying, bad economies, people don't have any money, you know, why should we be, why should we have two, three, four percent growth in, in these multilateral agencies? That's true, you know, and you can't complain really about that very much. But now we're faced with this real crisis where we don't have enough money, we don't have enough inspectors, and we have to we have to finish the you know the inventorying and the destruction of the Syrian chemical stockpile. It's Syria's responsibility. That's clear, but you've got to be a little realistic. Some of these countries So does Syria have to pay? Syria's supposed to I mean they're responsible financially for the and, and politically for the whole destruction operation. Yeah, you know, they should I mean we're in the United States we're paying for our complete destruction operation. You know, and that's one of the reasons it's been so slow and painfully, you know, off schedule because nobody's wanting to foot the bill. For this. So although the OPCW comes in and does helps with the actual process, they're not necessarily paying for it. No, no, no. The OPCW has no money. It, it's only it's only a it's a implementing agency funded by the states parties, and your your states parties have to fund it every year, otherwise it won't exist. And so the big the big funder. 20-odd percent is the United States. So you can imagine, they fa even though I said it's a non-discriminatory regime, you know, it, it is in theory, but in practice, the big payers have a lot more say. When they want to do something, they always look to the United States. And if you read the news the other day, you'll, you may have seen an article in, article in the newspaper that talked about the first Director General, Jose Bustani, uh, who was an ambassador from Brazil, who was ousted by the United States. And uh, it was illegal what the United States did, but the U.S. in 2002 said to the state's body, you need to get rid of this guy. And the U.S. didn't like him. The Bush administration didn't like him because he was running around talking to countries to join the treaty. And one of those countries happened to be, anyone know, Iraq and Saddam Hussein. And Saddam Hussein was apparently about to join the treaty. He didn't have any chemical weapons at that point except for these old bunkers. Uh, and of course, the United States had other plans for Saddam Hussein and the Bush administration. So they basically ousted, ousted Bustani, which showed kind of the power, I think, of the United States. That if they really disagreed with something, they could, you know, be like the elephant in the China shop and then push their weight around. Oh, but you had a, did you have a second question, too? It was about the funding. That was the funding question. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Time for the last question. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, stockpile of bluegrass army depot was the smallest, but it was also the most complex. Right. Can you talk about, I mean, what is it that makes it so complex? Good question. You picked up on that. Huh? Yeah, that's actually a very important question. The, um, ironically, bluegrass is far and away the smallest. You know, it's, it's 400, and, well, let me use U.S. tons. It's 523 U.S. tons. And Tuella, Utah, it was 14,400 U.S. tons. So <clears throat> enormous differences. But a lot of the Tuella stockpile and other stockpiles was in bulk agent, was in barrels, it wasn't weaponized. Uh, whereas everything at Bluegrass is weaponized. 
They also have um, they also have the most allegedly the most dangerous weapon, which is the M55 rocket I mentioned before. And the M55 rocket, I don't know how many thousand they have there, but it's a six foot long rocket. It has a little rocket motor on the end. Has uh, two kilograms of VX nerve agent in it. Uh, or actually rocket propellant first. And it's got a little plastic uh, membrane separates the rocket propellant from the VX nerve agent. And inside the VX nerve agent, it's got a, uh, a kind of vapor vaporization explosive, a dispersal explosive. And it's got a detonator explosive on the front end. And it's all kind of an aluminum unibody construction. And there's just no way to take it apart. And so uh, the, the military has been very, we've all been very worried that um, this has been very dangerous to demill at the other sites. Uh, you have to you have to use a very precision guillotine, a robotic guillotine that cuts off the rocket motor and hits the perforation space right between the propellant and the agent, and then carefully pulls out the burster cap and tries to remove the uh, explosive in the middle of the VX. And a whole number of them, I don't know how many, have exploded in the robot, you know, spraying VX all over the place and destroying the robots. And, and, uh, and the, in the 90s, the Army had a, even a video showing how these might, because of leakage between the rocket propellant and the VX, uh, that, that sort of plastic membrane it tends to be deteriorating, and there's, there's some convergence of the, of the energetic and the agent, that it would self-ignite. And they were very worried that if it self-ignites in the bunkers, they're all in these kind of beehive bunkers at the sites, it would set off every other rocket in the bunker and you'd have uh, the bunker cracked open with VX leaking out the bunker downwind, of course, and probably killing people. So there was a big um, you know, initiative put on trying to get rid of the M55 rockets as quickly as possible. Bluegrass has a lot of those. So all the construction of Bluegrass uh, has been armored buildings, which take you know, three times the amount of time to build. Um, and it's also got a very heterogeneous um, uh, stockpile. So it's got everything in the stock. Well, it's got landmines, spray tanks, aerial bombs, artillery shells, you name it. Uh, if it was in the American arsenal, it's a bluegrass. <clears throat> so it's, it's a small stockpile relative to the others, but it's actually the most uh, complicated and probably the most dangerous to destroy. So that's why bluegrass has just taken a long time. And it's also a neutralization facility. So the, uh, you know, it's one of the four states I mentioned that refused incineration. Um, and there's been so much politic around that. I, I still, it's hard for me to believe people are still mad over, you know, whether you're pro-incinerator or pro-neutral. But there's been this food fight internally uh, that's gone on for years between the incinerator guys and the you know, engineers tend to get somehow wed to whatever technology they're using. It's like nothing else is, you know, the right thing. And, um, and so Bluegrass and Pueblo, because they chose neutralization over incineration, were pushed to the, the back end of the of the schedule, and um, it's just taken a long time you know, to do it, and very expensive to do it too. But you know, it, it's going fine. Construction is ahead of schedule. It's going fine. I think we'll be, we'll be, we'll operate just fine. There is one new technology being used in the U.S. called supercritical water oxidation, or SQO, which we tested, uh, the Army tested uh, back in the 90s. Operates really well. Uh, it's a high pressure, high temperature. No flame, but high pressure, high temperature through electrical heat. Uh, basically, pipe. You throw anything in there. You can you can spray <coughs> in as a liquid. And about ten seconds later, it comes out the other end as all the basic you know composite materials: carbon dioxide, industrial salt, heavy metals, and some gunk and water. And that's it. Uh, but it's a really high maintenance potentially a high maintenance technology, so we have to look and see how that goes for the second, that's for the second stage treatment of the liquid neutralized uh, VX. We'll see, but I, I'm optimistic it'll go well. Last thank question, you. huh? Yes, um, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you, thank you all. <laughs> I'm gonna just uh, zip out of my PowerPoint here so I can take out my flash drive.